my cup runneth over. It's good to be home. It's good to sing with the family again. If you have a Bible, turn to Esther 5. Esther chapter 5. Esther's a unique book of the Bible. And y'all just have to, y'all just have to stop me. There's liberty here today. <laughs> Esther's a unique book in the Bible. In fact, as far as I could tell, you don't find the name of God mentioned in the book, but God is all throughout the book. And there's a message right there as far as just when you don't see him doesn't mean he's not working. Just when, you, just when his, uh, he's not announced doesn't mean he's not present. And God's hand, the unseen hand of God, is all throughout this really amazing story in the book of Esther. And Brother Joey asked me to preach a few weeks ago. Immediately my thought came to this. And uh, I just have had a few confirmations uh, just throughout the week. And I believe this is what the Lord would have me to preach today. And uh, I believe that it's no accident that you're here to hear it. And it's not because of me. I'm nothing. But God's word, as he said, God's word is the dynamite. It is the power. And it holds the truth. Paul told Timothy, preach the word. My opinions and preferences, you can come to me after church. But preach the word of God. That's what changes lives. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that makes the difference. Esther chapter 5. Look at verse number 9 here. It says, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. When he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children, all the things that were in the, in the king had promoted him. And how he had advanced him above the princes and the servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeres his wife and his, all his friends unto him, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman. And he caused the gallows to be made. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. The first part here. On that night. Isn't that ironic? We call that a coincidence. I call it providence. On that night. Could not the king sleep? Would you pray with me? Pray for me. That Lord will help us this morning. Father, Lord, it's, Lord, it's already been good to be in your house. Lord, to gather together with other believers. Lord, to sing your praises. Lord, to understand the brevity of life. Lord, and the importance that our life counts for you. Lord, I pray, Lord, today, Lord, that you'd use me. Lord, that you'd give me the words. Father, Lord, that you'd fill me. Lord, I can't say anything that will help these people, Lord, but you can say something. And I pray you do just that. In your name we ask. Amen. Coincidence or providence? The verses that we read up, and we're going to go through chapter 6 here in just a second. But if, you, if you're like me and you sometimes lose track when the preacher's reading, and <laughs> you're like, what did we just cover here? Verse 9, starting as Haman is leaving uh, the first of two banquets that Queen Esther uh, is throwing, and just him and King Ahasuerus uh, were present at. And, you know, he's feeling really great about himself, as most of us do when we're kind of in the VIP group. And he's leaving, and as, as everyone else bows to Haman, all these other peasants, you know, uh, there's this one man by the name of Mordecai who will not bow to Haman. Because Haman, because uh, Mordecai, rather, bowed to one person, and it wasn't Haman. It was Almighty God. And it bothered Haman that Mordecai did not bow. He goes home and he talks about all the things that he has to his wife and his friends. And he has a pity party of sorts. And he tells them he has all these things. He has kids. He has wealth. But Mordecai won't bow. And Zeresh, his wife, gave him some really good counsel. He said, just kill him. I was joking. It's not good counsel. You don't, don't kill people you don't like, all right? She said, oh, it's easy. Just kill him. Make a gallows. Uh, what we would be about 75 feet tall and, and have Mordecai killed. 
So Haman, I mean, I just use my imagination, perhaps heaps up all night thinking about Mordecai. We get to chapter 6, verse 1, and we see that the king is up this night as well. It says in chapter 6, verse 1 again, it says, On that night could not the king sleep. Can I just say this real quick? Is that if this was any other night, it wouldn't have mattered. If this was the next day that the king couldn't sleep, if you know the story where I'm going, if, if it was any other night, it wouldn't have had any value. Do you know God's providence is seen in our problems as much as they are in our promotions? God's providence is seen in our problems. He had a sleeping problem. I didn't sleep a wink last night. My one and a half year old is sick. And every 20 minutes, I think on the, on the dot, he woke up crying. And I thought, this is just confirmation. I can't sleep. You know, this is what, I, this is what I'm supposed to preach. Esther 6, it says he could not sleep. Continue reading in verse 1 of chapter 6. It says, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. The chronicles, this is the boring history of the kingdom, the part no one likes. It could include things like genealogies that we skip over. We literally have two books in our Bible, first and second chronicles. What is that? It's books of remembrance. It's history. It's things that have happened. The king couldn't sleep. He said, you know what will put me to sleep? If you'll get out and read me those chronicles. <laughs> I told my church I'm about to start charging for my services. People that can't sleep at home, they can come and hear me preach, and they take the best nap of their life. I'm about to start charging at the door. I'll just have a... Couldn't sleep, so he said, why don't y'all read me the Chronicles? So we have, you know, a few coincidences going on at the same time. We have, first of all, the king couldn't sleep on that night. We have, secondly, what, uh, what he asked to do. You know, he had women, he had pleasure, he had musicians, but he wanted to be read to. Then as we continue reading, we notice what he reads about. Verse 2, and it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh. Now, Aaron, some of y'all don't know, we're here this weekend for a gender reveal. And as I was reading this, I thought, what a beautiful name for their baby girl, Big Thana. <laughs> they, can, they can have Big Thana and we'll have Little Thana. <laughs> no, I got to get serious here. It was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thana. If you know Esther, you know Big Thana and Teresh. They were two of the king's chamberlains that were trying to assassinate the king. And Mordecai heard about it. And I preached a message on this in Esther last year of speak up, it could save somebody's life. And Mordecai just simply told somebody, and it saved the king. So, so we have all these coincidences. He can't sleep. He has to be read to. And they read. Isn't that a coincidence? They read the account when Mordecai saved the king's life. Two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hold on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. Verse 4, and the king said, who was in the court? Another coincidence here. Amen. Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said unto him, let him come in. The king's being read to, and they, they tell him about how this man, this humble Mordecai, saved his life. And the king's like, well, what, what do we do for Mordecai? You know, like, he deserves a little something for this. You know, what has been done? They say, oh, nothing's been done for Mordecai. And about that time, just another coincidence we see here, you know, no connection. About that time, you might hear a whistle. I'm not going to try. I can't really whistle. I was about to. He might hear a whistle coming in, and they say, who's that? And they say, oh, it's Haman. And Haman, Haman walks in, and... Little do they know that Haman had been thinking about Mordecai and the, the king had been thinking about Mordecai, but just in two very different ways. Get to verse 6. It says, And Haman came in. The king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? This is the thing about pride, because Haman was very prideful, is you always think everyone's talking about you. That's the thing about pride. You always think everyone's talking about you. Well, they might be looking at you, but it's because you have a tag on your shirt. <laughs> That's funny because last week I preached in this suit. I bought a new suit, and I got through the whole message, and our visitor stopped me. I literally said, Pastor, there's a tag under your... <laughs> I had everyone's attention. I said, they say, Pastor, got a new suit. I, oh, this old thing? <laughs> what you talking about? <laughs> but you know what pride does is pride says everyone's talking about me. 
Everyone's worried about me. Everyone's thinking about me. And the king walks in, his, or Haman walks into the king, rather, and he, he says, what should be done for the man who the king delights to honor? And Haman, in his arrogant self, thinks, surely there's no one else he could want to honor other than me. So notice what happens. This is really quite comical. In the middle of verse 6, now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to honor more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king uses to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. Let his apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that may array the man withal whom the king delighted to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Haman gets to pick the reward. The king says, what do you think? You, it's a blank check. What do you want to put here? What should we do for the man who the king delighted to honor? And he's, you know, we get the theme here. Haman really wants to be the king. He talks about the royal horse, the royal robes, the royal crown. And he does all things. And it has where it says, great, go get Mordecai. And you parade him around the streets. So the man that went and essentially was trying to assassinate Mordecai ends up being the one parading the horse. Hail the one, the king delights to honor. Hail, the, and you know, got to stop. You know, maybe he called his wife and said, you know, she's like, is, is Mordecai dead yet? You know, on his iPhone back then. Is Mordecai, he's like, no, hold on a minute. Hail the one, the king delights to honor. Just another coincidence, isn't it? Do you believe in coincidences? I don't, I, I used to, I don't know. I mean, I always believed in God's hand and thing, but I don't believe God wastes a thing that happens in our life. I think we can understand that in the sense of the good things, can't we? We're blessed, me and Aaron, it's just really, God's just blessed us to both be having children at the same time. I can see God's hand when he blesses us. But, but what it's hard to see is in August of last year, whenever we got the great news, we were expecting a little baby. And then Leah started having some complications and went to the doctor and we got the confirmation that you lost your baby. See, I could see God's hand in the promotion. You're blessed. But can you see God's hand in the problem? The same week that we lost our baby, a family in our church lost their baby. And I don't know why God does everything that he does. I can't pretend to know those things. But I know God wastes no pain. Amen. That the problems that he gives me, it reminds me that my problems are for more than just me. Ahasuerus' sleeping problem really wasn't about him. It was about Mordecai. What we have the tendency to do, what I have the tendency to do, is to think essentially that everything's all about me all the time. And that the pain that God's allowed, it's about me. I can't tell you how many times I've used Misty Dickerson as sermon illustrations at my church because of what God has done in her life to affect me. She didn't know a little boy was watching her when, in the old building when she lost all of her hair from cancer, from the chemo. And when they went and anointed him, when she got in the car wreck and I went and visited her and they said that I don't think she's going to make it. See, her problems, yes, they were for her, but they were a lot bigger than just her. Amen. And the problems you're in, they're not just for you. They're for someone else, too. And the king couldn't sleep, but it wasn't just about the king. And what God's doing in your life. Yes, there's a lesson for you there, but it's not just about you. See, here's how big God is, okay? Here's how big God is. is he can take my problems and he can teach me something. And he can teach someone else in my church something from it. And he can teach someone in my family something from it. What is it? It's the providence of God. It's the promise of Romans 8, 28, that all things we know, do you know it? That all things work together for good for my good, for his glory. The providence of God. We see the providence of God, as I've already said, it's seen in a problem. You know what providence means? Pro means before. That root word vidence, that's where we get our word vision. It literally means that God saw before. <laughs> God knew before, God saw before, and God met the need before. I like the phrase, long before I ever needed an apple, the apple tree was planted. We are reaping the benefits of what someone else has sown years 
years ago. Amen. In a church, you don't, you don't have a church like this uh, just on a startup. There, there's been a lot of things that have been sewn into that. I know Brother Joe knows that, Brother Rusty, all of those before. This isn't just one or two people here. This is a work that God has done. And it's something that's been perpetuated. It's God's provision. The provision of God is seen in a problem. There was a reading there. There was a realization. He read. I like the preacher that said, reading will do a great deal of damage to your ignorance. A lot of you need to get off Facebook for your theology, okay? That's why you're confused. But when you get in the Word of God, you start to read. And what it does is it enlightens us. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And what it will do is it will destroy your ignorance on some things. I'm reminded of the, the mom. Her son was in college, and uh, he called his mom and said, Mom, I need some money. And so what she did, this good old Christian mom, is she had a Bible, and she mailed her son a Bible. And her son called again about two weeks later. He said, Mom, I got the Bible you got, but I need some money. <laughs> You know, I need to eat. You know, I need all these things. And she said, have you been reading your Bible? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've been reading my Bible. Have you been praying? Yeah, yeah, all right. He called again about three weeks later. She said, he said, Mom, I, I really this, I really have to have some money. She said, son, if you would have been reading your Bible, like I told you to, you would have noticed that I put four $100 bills right in the middle of it. And I, I told my church that last year. I used this illustration and said, it pays to read the Word of God. But I, I did. I preached this message, and then when I got home that night, I opened my Bible, and there was two $100 bills. So I thought I'd preach that today and see what happens. <laughs> I'll leave my Bible up here just if anyone is interested. There was a reading. There was a realization. You know, what Mordecai had done, he didn't do it for the accolade. He didn't save the king's life, so everyone would say, apparently, we don't know exactly how many weeks or months had transpired, but we know the motive for Mordecai was just to save a life. It wasn't that everyone saw him, that he got the, the uh, attention. You know, if you do what you do for people to recognize you, you, don't, you won't do what you do very long. If you're doing what your service is, and I don't know what it might be, but if you're laboring for someone to recognize you, then you won't do it very long because people won't always recognize you. I, I know pastors, of course, in the room, Brother George, Brother Joe, they understand that. There's some things behind the scenes, but it's not just for pastors. If you're laboring, if you're working, if you're doing something for the recognition, then it won't last very long. But Mordecai did the right thing because it was the right thing to do. And God saw to it, notice that, that he was rewarded for it. I thought about the verse in Hebrews chapter 6 that says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye minister to the saints and do minister. There's a, a saying in our culture that we use. We say the devil's in the details, and I say that's not true. God is. The devil's in, no, 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 God's in the details. God's in the minute things. God's in every event. It was no accident that I was born to Charles and Daniel Howington of Livingston, Louisiana, that was born and raised in this church, and that God has placed me where he's put. It's no accident that God has us where he has us. It's the providence of God. Don't believe in coincidence. The providence of God in a problem. We see the providence of God in a promotion. We see that Haman is going and He's parading around Mordecai, his, his worst enemy. And I just kind of laugh at it like, that's what you get. <laughs> that's what you get. And he goes on, it continues, and uh, go down to verse 12. It says, And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shall surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. See the providence of God in our problems. We see the providence of God in our promotions. We also see in this story the providence of God in this prophecy by Zeresh, the one that told him, hey, why don't you kill Mordecai? That'll solve your problem. Now when Haman comes back and she hears what God did, how he was going to be killed, and now you just spent your day parading him around the city, she told her husband, she said, surely 
you've begun to fall and you won't prevail against him. You know why? Because he wasn't just fighting Mordecai. He was fighting God. A lot, of, a lot of Christians think they're fighting flesh and blood. You think that person that you just can't stand is your enemy and you just don't realize we're fighting spiritual darkness and wickedness in high places. Haman wasn't fighting Mordecai. He was trying to fight Mordecai's God. He was trying to fight Jehovah God. The providence of God in this prophecy. I think about the providence of God in my own life. There's so many stories I could tell you, and I'll be finished here in just a moment. But I read this story, and it's unique, once again, because you don't see God's name explicitly mentioned, but you see the hand of God everywhere you turn. The hand of God is evident in every page. The prophecy of God that was given here by his wife. I think I would be amiss this morning. I don't know who's here, but I'd be amiss to tell you that speaking of the providence of God, the Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain for the foundation of the world. And if you're here today and you are lost, and look, I know how it is in Livingston because I was raised here, and it's the same way in Kilgore. Everybody's a good old boy in East Texas, right? Just like here. Everybody knows everybody. Oh, that's just, you know, if you're pulled over on the, in a ditch on the side of the road, they'll help you get out. But being a good old boy won't get you to heaven. Amen. Everybody has been to church. Everybody's grandma prays. You know the story and how it goes. Do you know that's not enough to save you? You have to come to the point where you realize that you are a sinner in need of saving. Our standard of good people, it's not about just being nice. I know lost people that are nicer than saved people. It's not enough to be nice. The Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. You're here today and you have broken God's law. You are a sinner. You must realize your need of saving. But you must also realize this, that God has already provided for you. God has already provided for you. The provision of God. What is it? He saw before what we needed. He knew that I was lost. He knew that I, I needed to be saved. And what did he do? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was slain for me. It's the provision of God. It's that God knew that apart from Jesus Christ, there's no way I could have fellowship with him. He knew that there was no other way. So Jesus Christ walked the road to Calvary. We live in a complacent Christian society in America. Most people can tell you the story, and yet if it rains, we're not going to come to church. If we stayed up a little too late Saturday, and I must be hitting something here because it's getting quiet. Is it like this in East Texas? It's like this in South Louisiana still? It's not a priority anymore, and I hear about stories of people in Africa that walk three miles and they'll stay all day, and they can't get enough. And people in America say, well, the preacher preached a little long last week. And we wonder why we are the way we are. You wonder why our government, our society, our schools. Lost people will act like lost people. It's when saved people act like lost people that we should be worried. Of course the lost people will do that. But the Christians... You claim the name of Christ, and it's a surprise if you show up. Look, you don't have to come to this. I would recommend this one. You don't have to come to this one, but you need to go to some church that preaches the truth of God's word. Amen. That was free. It wasn't even in here. I'll close with this, the providence of God. I guess it was a little over a year ago, because Brother Joey said they've been here a year. We, had been, we just celebrated two years in... Kilgore, uh, I am <laughs> still the young pastor. I'll be the young pastor for 10 more years. <laughs> People walk in, and they think I'm the youth pastor, and I get it. I mean, I would, too. It's just God's, just God's done it. I didn't try to force my hand at it. But we've been blessed over there. God has been good. But I'll tell you this. There's been some hard days there, too. There was a service when we were first there. You know, it's exciting at first. Everyone, you've probably experienced this. Everyone's going to hear the new pastor. But about six months after the honeymoon's off, you really see who's going to be there. And we had a service, first year we were there, with three people, including myself. <laughs> and you know, most everyone I know would say that's a failure. You'd say, you probably need to go do music for somebody. You probably need to go be an assistant. But God put me there. I wasn't going to leave till God told me to leave, Brother Joey. And the providence of God, I, this is, 
It blows my mind. Y- y'all know about Brother Rusty's health and the problems that he was having. So what did God do for me? I tell you, he did it for me. As God sent the one that pastored me for 20 years. Come on, yes, sir. Come on. And he sent him to Kilgore. <laughs> and now when I get done preaching, I want to crawl under the first row because I just feel like I missed it. The first person after every service that comes up to me with the smile on his face. With compassion. There's Rusty Silvertooth. He comes up to me. And he lifts me up. It's the providence of God. I don't know if I would still be there. Me and Leah say all the time, God, how do we make it without them? When something needs to be done, the best church members are former pastors because they understand, they know. And well, like last week, this is what it's like being a pastor. I got done preaching my heart out for 45 minutes and someone came up to me and said, gosh, you're gaining a lot of weight. <laughs> this, is why I need, this is why I need Brother Rusty. I said, that's what you took away from this message. Thank you. (laughs) But I look back, and I see how God worked in a problem. And how God has used it for good. And I, I won't pretend to know what you're going through, but I know there's people in this room that are in problems, and they don't see, they cannot fathom how anything good will come out of it. And I want to point you to Jesus Christ today to see that he can do exceeding abundantly above what you could ask or think. And I I just want to encourage you to trust him. Oh, for grace, the songwriter said, oh, for grace to trust him more. Every preacher, you know, it's fun to preach every now and then. It's a different thing to pastor. You face moments of discouragement, I can't tell you how many times I've resigned to Leah. <laughs> and then I accept the position again. <laughs> but God, I believe, not only gives us what we need when we need it, but who we need Amen. when we need it. Right. And I'm finished this morning. Miss Tammy, you could come, whoever's going to play. I want you to meditate on this the providence of God. There's no such thing as coincidence. <laughs> no such thing as coincidence. I believe in providence. And look, what you're facing today, trust him. Because he is able to do more than what you could fathom.